Those of you who listen to my sermons on a regular basis know that one of the things I think got the church on to the wrong track for a while was this era of good feelings. And when I talk about the era of good feelings, I'm talking about a very specific time in mainline Protestantism. That's a time that I would mark from late 40s to early 70s. And it was this time that people look back with a lot of nostalgia because they go, but the churches were full and everyone wore suits and everything was great and grand. But it was also that period of time that failed to pass the faith on to the next generation successfully. It was also that period of time where all sorts of bad things we discover later were occurring. Not just mainline Protestantism, but all over the place. One of the biggest problems that we have today that come from that period of time was that when that World War II generation grew up, they had the worst childhoods of anyone because they grew up in that Great Depression, the worst depression we'd ever had. Few people in this room probably can even imagine how horrible it was. They then grew up to go into the worst and most horrific war humanity has ever seen, and I pray to God we'll never see something worse than that again. And then live through the reality of understanding the Holocaust and what was truly going on and the inhumanity of humanity. When they came home from that war, and those of you who had World War II parents know this, what they wanted was normalcy, peace, and quiet. They wanted things to be simple because their life had always been difficult. They wanted things to be black and white because their life had been one of grays. They wanted a better world for their children. A simpler world, a more peaceful world. What they did wrong, they did out of nobility, not out of spite. What they did wrong in Christianity, however, was they took a Christianity that lives into the grace, that lives into the complexities of life, that has thousands of years of wisdom, and tried to boil it down to black and white issues of ideology, tried to boil it down to the heroes of the Bible, the villains of the Bible, tried to make the Bible a comic book that was easy. And any part of it that was hard complicated, challenging, they simply ignored. I bring this up because today is Confirmation Sunday. And Confirmation Sunday as a tradition, Confirmation as a tradition, suffered much the same fate that many of our understandings of the Bible do from this same phenomenon. Prior to that time, the era of good feelings, Confirmation had always been understood as this gray, weird, ambiguous adolescence of spirituality. Adolescence itself is a weird, gray place. Any of y'all remember being an adolescent? We were all awkward, right? Not one of us wasn't awkward. And you're awkward because you have one foot in childhood, one foot in adulthood, and you're doing what you're supposed to do as a child, which is to become a well-adjusted adult, Right? That's the goal of childhood. And you're getting there slowly. And as you work your way through adolescence, you become more of an adult than a child at some point. But it isn't a good... You can't exactly say, like, on this date, at this hour, I became 50... or 49.6% adult. Or 50.0001. Right? You can't point to that in your own adolescence. You can't say the exact moment you became an adult if you're an adult now, right? Confirmation is a spiritual journey. That was way too messy as an idea for that older generation. That's not black and white at all. That is messy. It's true, but it's messy. And so what they did is they said, okay, we're getting rid of all this stuff, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to make it graduation. Right? You're going to have a photo. You're going to put it in the big spinny thing that's at every old church, you know, right? With the big thing. We're going to put it up on the wall. We're going to do that. We're going to have everyone be in robes. If you look at really old confirmation photos, they didn't have them. We're going to have it just like a graduation. We're going to surround it with all the things of it. Because you know what? Graduations are black and white, right? You either did or you didn't graduate. You either got a diploma or you didn't. You either went on to do something else or you didn't. 
Graduations are easy. They're simple. And that's what the generation wanted. But what did they bring with it? A new phenomenon. Phenomenon where they told everyone, you graduated Christianity, and they went, great, I don't have to come back, just like high school. And that phenomenon began because we changed the tradition. We forgot who we were. So let's talk about it in that older, more difficult, more complex, but more true way of understanding what's going on today. Today is not a graduation. I'm sorry to tell you, you did not graduate Christianity. I haven't graduated Christianity. If I ever do, I'll let you know, okay? But what's really going on here is that we as a community have a new group of adults. A new group that have reached spiritual adulthood. Because at some point, you got to draw a line and say, okay, I guess you're adulting enough. Here you go. Government does that at 18, right? You're adulting enough. I guess you can vote. But just like with voting at 18, we all know 18-year-olds we can think of and we'd be like, yeah, you're really responsible enough. You totally could vote. You've really thought through and you know the candidates. You do all this. We can also think of 68-year-olds that we're terrified if they cast a ballot. Same thing with driving. We can think of 18-year-olds who are good, responsible drivers. We can think of 79-year-olds who were terrified around the road. Right? Maturity is not just an issue of age. It's an issue of where you are on your journey. As a, quote, young clergy person, which I still haven't been able to shake that yet, even though I'm 43, as a young clergy person, I don't know how many times I've had an older clergy person come to me and lecture me on the ways in which I should be doing church, only for me to learn later I've been ordained longer. We all sort of get this. You all get it, right? As adults, part of your role in what is going on today is a challenge, a deep challenge of what it means to be older than somebody. That challenge is to not see them as the eight-year-old you loved. That sounds like that shouldn't be hard, but man, is it hard. Think in your own life. You all probably have at least one family member who you meet up with who still thinks you're like nine. Right? Parent, older sibling, who... You will tell you things, and you're like, yeah, no, seriously, I sold insurance. I understand. i got to have insurance on my car. Right? That's because part of the human condition is that we are so prone to only see the person we want to see, not the person who's there. And so you want to see that little kid that you love, that's adorable, that's simple, that's easy, that's nice, that's not awkward at all, that's not going to ask you hard questions or challenge your ideas. And yet we have new adults who are here to do exactly that, to ask questions, push the community, to stand up and do what it is as your equal. Any one of you, any time, if you have an issue about what you want the church to do, can always go ahead and create a petition. 10% of all members sign it. We 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 have a specially called meeting. Guess what? Any of you guys can do that. So can these guys after today. Any of you all can run for council if you're a member in good standing. After today, any of you guys can too, and it doesn't have to be the youth position. The only limitations on them at this point do not come from the church. They come from the state of Pennsylvania. Those limitations are few. So our responsibility as those who are older is to realize they are not the future. They are the now. They are not here for us to just pass along our wisdom. They're here for us to have conversations with. They're no longer here for us to say, oh, we can't talk about that, but say, okay, if you're ready to ask the question, we're ready to give the response. This is why I love teaching confirmation, guys. You all know I love doing that, right? And part of the reason I love doing that is because I get to come in here and say, hey, I know you've always heard these very black and white, easy Sunday school answers. Let me tell you, there's a lot of weird stuff out there in the Bible. We talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit's name is Sophia. What does that mean? We talked about the reality that there were female pastors in the early church. What does that mean? We talked about the idea that if you try to be a literalist, you can't make it out of Genesis 2 without having to lie to yourself because you can't be a literalist. These are adult questions that I'm sure some of the adults are going, what? At this moment, but because you guys came, because you worked so hard, 
you've tackled those questions. And while you may have different answers than I do, and that's great, that means you're along your spiritual journey. And anyone who just said, what, this, this Holy Spirit has a name and it's Sophia? You guys are a little ahead on that one. This, however, is also a two-way street. And, well, there is a debate whether or not this comes from Spider-Man or from Star Trek, and I'm going to stand on the Star Trek side of this. With great, re- with great abilities come great, re- or with great power comes great responsibility. Here's the thing. You are adults. When an adult walks into my office and they say to me, I want the church to be X, Y, Z, my response to all these adults and any of them who've done this know this is, great, how are you going to make it happen? Know that that's my response to you. Because you have the ability to make the community what you want to, just like everybody else. You have the same challenge the adults have of you. Well, they are tempted to see you as children. You will be tempted to see them as simply old people. Let me explain what I mean. You've only known your parents as old people. You only knew your nana and your pop-up as old, old people. But here's the thing. I know your parents' ages. And the reality is they're either millennial or Gen Xers, which means your grandparents are baby boomers, which means the question you should ask nana is, hey, you came from the generation that created the miniskirt. Did you wear one? (laughs) The question you should ask pop-pop is, did he make it to Woodstock or did he even try? Because here's the thing, your grandparents' generation like fought in the streets for civil rights. Your grandparents' generation went to rock concerts. Your grandparents' generation did crazy, awesome things, just like you. You can ask me about Puff the Magic Dragon, because that ain't about a dragon. (laughs) Okay? I'm loading them up with questions for you all, all right? Your parents also aren't just these people who've always been 40 or 50 something who are there to like annoy you. Your parents were once children. Not only were they once children, they were the last analog babies. And when I say analog babies, what I really mean is feral. Okay? I was part of that generation. I was the end of the feral children where they just like handed your parents, handed you a key, said, get yourself in. Good luck. If I don't make it in home time for dinner, there's 20 bucks hidden here. Buy a pizza. Your parents, just as much as you might be sitting there going, man, I want to go back to see Taylor Swift, or I want to see Taylor Swift, wanted to see Madonna or Britney Spears. Just as much as your heart might might have gotten crushed by a relationship that never happened, a relationship that did and didn't work out, so did your parents. Just like you're nervous about college, your parents were too. Just as you're conflicted about it, they might have been two. There's a reason they watch Stranger Things. It's because it reminds them of their childhood. See, part of this adult thing is that there's nothing more adulty than asking for help, looking for wisdom, and having an honest conversation where you talk about your thoughts, your feelings, your dreams. Because that's how we learn. That's not how you learn or they learn, it's how we all adults learn. Because whatever you're going through, today, tomorrow, in the future, your parents, your grandparents, someone in this community has been through something similar, good or bad. If you ever need help, that's why Pentecost exists. See, God today says to all of us that he's going to send the Spirit to answer the questions, to be there, to be his voice. The Spirit doesn't come down and give us a monologue of what we should or should not do. It's not what the Spirit does. The Spirit does. Spirit founds the church. Not pastors, not buildings, not the hierarchy, none of that. That's unimportant. He founds the real church, all y'all. Because what the Spirit knew was those answers, the support, 
the things you need to live the Christian life doesn't exist with me, doesn't exist with Mr. Neil or Miss Kim or Harry. It exists here. As you go out today, regardless of your age, regardless of why you're here, take some time in your prayer life and ask yourself two things. One, have you fallen for that so easy thing to look at someone as simply young or simply old and by that the other? Forgetting that they are fully human like you? And two, two, 